promises and pitfalls of reconstruction. If you have edition 9, this is of course chapter 11. If you have edition 7, uh, reconstruction is covered in chapter 12. During the war and after the war, of course, as the slaves were leaving the plantations, they got into wagons and went to the Union lines. And this is what you're seeing in the background is the tents of the Union Army. January of 1865, Congress passes the 13th Amendment that formally freed slaves in all the states, including the neutral border slave states that had sided with the Union. The passage was not unanimous, even though there was no southern state representatives in Congress. The vote was 119 for and 56 against. President Lincoln signed the bill on February the 1st. Unfortunately, he would not be alive to see its ratification and its ramifications. Now, I hope you understood that statement about the 13th Amendment nullifying the Three Fifths Compromise in the Constitution. Very simply put, a black man can now be counted as a full person for representative purposes in the House of Representatives. The North, or I should say Republicans in the North, just about had a duck fit when they realized what had been done because now the South had a larger portion of representatives possible. So arguments and speeches were made to glorify the Republican Party who had ended the war and set the black slaves free. After all, it was that dreaded, unrepentant South that had caused all the destruction and deaths. In addition, as if to prove the point, the South had begun passing black codes to legally enslave the newly free black man. And while all this is going on, Congress was having another fight on their hands. The President Lincoln had taken unconstitutional powers into the presidency during the war, but that's not unusual. During the war, in every war this happened, uh, you can't have several hundred people trying to make a decision instantaneously, so one man has to do it, and that falls on the lap of the President. The Congress was of the opinion that it was their responsibility to run the Reconstruction in the deal, and Lincoln believed it was the President's job. So we have the age-old argument between the two houses of power, which has the upper hand, the Presidency, are the Congress, and we still have this battle going on today at times. Now you heard and saw the word radical Republican. They were just the part of the Republican Party that believed that the South should be punished as if it were a losing nation in war. Punished and reconstructed, that's what they intended to do. Reconstruct the South and the enemies the North wanted. But the South had other plans and other ideas as well as the President. Lincoln had proposed a very easy plan to bring the rebellious states back into the Union, you know, with malice toward none stuff. If 10% of the registered voters as of 1860 voted in a new constitution outlawing slavery and ratified the 13th Amendment, they could be readmitted to the Union. That's the 10% plan. But you have to realize that in 1860, nobody could vote except a few wealthy white men in the South. The radicals in the Congress wanted a lot of a stronger plan, and they presented one called the Wade Davis. Now, this required a much larger percentage of voters, and it also disenfranchised a lot of the Confederate officers, as well as repudiating the debt of the Confederate War. And it was set as a bill to the president, and he had it in his pocket the night he was assassinated. That's where we get the sailing, uh, saying pocket veto, uh, because the bill, once it goes to the president, it has to be either vetoed or signed within a certain amount of time. Well. He died, so I guess you could say the bill died along with him, thus we have the expression pocket veto. Now Lincoln had publicly given up on the idea of relocation of the free black man, but privately he hoped it could still happen. The radicals in Congress, as well as the black man, shot that idea quickly. Uh, they had other ideas. And I will pause just a minute to remind you that Lincoln did not condone or approve of slavery but in no way did he believe the black man was equal to the white man. And that little story in your text of the two Creoles in New Orleans demonstrates it very well. Lincoln was going on that the intelligent or those who had served in the military be allowed to vote. Now my question is, intelligent by what standards? Being able to read? Uh, knowing how to pick cotton? Knowing when to come in out of the rain? Who's going to make the determination of intelligence? Of course, we can't ask the president those questions, but I do believe they would have been asked had he lived. The Congress is still trying to regain power. And with the assassination of Lincoln, they looked upon Vice President Johnson as a good successor to Lincoln, because he was a Southerner, but he remained loyal to the North and the only Southern senator to not go South, as they say. So they thought he hated the South. 
if it could not have been more wrong. There's Mr. Andrew Johnson. Sarpus, huh? Born in Raleigh, North Carolina. I want to tell you a little bit about it. His parents were illiterate. His father had scratched out a living as a hotel porter or a bank janitor in Raleigh and died when Andrew was only three years old. And the one story I read was he had died while trying to save two wealthy employers from drowning. Uh, but that's just they say type thing. So the widowed mother worked as a weaver and a spinner to free, feed Andrew, uh, Andrew and his older brother. But she remarried while Andrew was still quite young. And although we now had a husband in the family and more children coming along, uh, it didn't do anything to improve the finances. So when Andrew was 14, his parents apprenticed him, the two boys, he and his older brother, to a tailor. Yeah, I don't know if you understand the word apprenticed or not. Uh, it's basically a form of legal, like slavery. Uh, a man who knows how to do something such as a tailor or a plumber or a carpenter, he agrees to take on a young person, a male of course, and feed him and clothe him and teach him the trade for, and after a number of years he'll be to be a qualified person. But meanwhile he has total control over your body and your soul. Well, it's been said that Andrew had a sense of humor and he was joking around one day and made a comment about the gentleman who he had been apprenticed to and he got angry and he was going to beat the two boys and the two boys decided they weren't going to take it so they ran away. So they were gone for about two years and of course they had a reward on their head because uh, they'd broken the law, they'd broken the contract their mother had made with the, uh, with the tailor. So Andrew sneaks back into Raleigh in 1826 to reunite with his mother and his stepfather. He talks them into moving on further west and they get a one horse cart and they head down the mountains to Greenville, Tennessee, which is just across the border from North Carolina into Tennessee. Now I don't know how many of you have ever been in those mountains in North Carolina, but I know what they're like in the 21st century. They're steep and narrow and <laughs> not a a whole lot of fun to travel as far as I'm concerned, but I can only imagine what they were like back in this time. Uh, there wouldn't have been any roads at all, probably just mud. And the irony is this one horse cart wasn't a one horse cart, it was a one mule cart and the mule was blind. And every time I think about him coming down those mountains with a blind mule, it just <laughs> it tickles my funny bone. When they arrive in Greenville, Tennessee, the first thing he does is set up a shop as a tailor because he's become pretty good at it. And he met this young girl named Isa, uh, 16 years old, was the daughter of a, I think it was a tavern owner. But she was very intelligent. She knew how to read and write and had a little bit more, I should say, savoir faire about her. And thanks to her, because Andrew had never mastered the basics of English grammar or reading or math. And in 1827, the only child of the village, I oh, was a shoemaker, I think it was, yeah. Uh, they got married, and she wrote in her diary later that it was love at first sight as far as she was concerned. She knew who she was going to marry. But it was a great match for Andrew because she taught him how to read and write. And while he's sewing, she teaches him how to invest money, and he becomes a little bit more uh, presentable and has a little bit more to. He, he invests in real estate and farmland. And he was such a well likable person that he ran for an alderman in town. He's just going to be there a year. And, he served several terms as an alderman and then went on to be the mayor of Greenville. About 1834, he was only 24 years old, he'd already been town alderman and mayor. He called himself a Jacksonian Democrat and he aligned himself with the common man and ideology of the populace at the time. 1834 and 1838, he runs for his elected to the state legislature in the lower house. 1841, he serves as a uh, Tennessee State Senator. 1843 to 1853, 10 years, he actually served in the House of Representatives in D.C. as a representative from Tennessee. And he ran for, uh, he lost his job, I guess you'd say, because they redistricted him. And in 1853, he ran for governor, and then he ran second term for governor. So he served two terms as governor of Tennessee. When his second term was over with, he uh, He ran for U.S. Senator. I do apologize. I, I live in an apartment in there doing maintenance work this morning. It's rather loud at times. 
So he had a total of 32 years in politics. He was very popular with the people, and he really genuinely liked working with the underdog. And some of the things he was for, uh, he was for federal, uh, he opposed federal funding of internal improvements, which is one of Henry Clay's pet projects. But he did support free western lands to settlers. He also decided for a while he wanted to form a separate state in eastern Tennessee uh, and around Virginia and parts of Kentucky and Tennessee to set up their own state to get the common man away from this elite planter class. He supported the Compromise of 1850. He was for annexation of Texas and Oregon. He was for the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And he supported Kentucky's John C. Calhoun uh, Breckinridge for John Calhoun Breckinridge for uh, president in 1860. Very firmly pro-union. He, I think he and Henry Clay would have probably gotten along. He thoroughly criticized President Buchanan for not doing enough to stop the secessionist movement. Because it was his idea that this movement was strictly a conspiracy of the planter elite. He did champion religious freedom. He attacked the anti-Catholic prejudices and, and but then again he turns around and he uses racist language against blacks. But anyway, when Tennessee left the Union, she was the last state to, uh, to leave the Union uh, to join the Confederacy. Johnson stayed in D.C. And of course, in the South, he was deemed a traitor and he was hung in effigy. The properties were confiscated and his wife and two daughters were essentially driven from the state with a little more than what they carried in the wagon. But in the North, Johnson's stand made him an overnight hero. He was praised in the press as being a true patriot who had risked his life and his fortunes to side with the Union in the Civil War. And following Union victories in Tennessee, President Lincoln appointed Johnson the military governor of the state, giving the rank of Brigadier General. And he had the power to discharge all executive duties and judicial functions, and he ruled with an extremely heavy head. I think your text mentions that he arrests clergy who support the Confederacy and um, dismissed state office holders who were unwilling to denounce secession, closed anti-union newspapers, seized all railroads in the state, and supervised military operations from Nashville. He even levied very high taxes on the planters, especially the planters. He was chosen to be Lincoln's running mate in 1864 because he supposedly headed the South. But I ask yourself, with what I've just told you, did it sound like he really hated the South or just he didn't want to see the country disunionized. Uh, he also, <laughs> well, he didn't like the rich people. They made fun of him. He hadn't gone to the right schools. He hadn't been a member of the proper class. He didn't have any chutzpah, I guess you'd say. I don't know. Um, but everyone wasn't for Andrew being the vice president. I mean, the leader of the radical Republicans, Thaddeus, Thaddeus, Thaddeus Stevens, was not for him. But when Lincoln was assassinated, of course, Andrew becomes the president. And from the day he was inaugurated in December, until December of 1865, the question of Reconstruction was almost totally in the hands of Johnson because Congress had recessed just right after the uh, oath of office and the funeral and did not reconvene until December. <coughs> Excuse me. So for eight months, John Johnson had his own plans of Reconstruction, and uh, he used his own policies, and he interpreted Lincoln's plan to suit himself. He appointed provisional governors to the defeated states and required them to call special conventions to draft new constitutions that abolish slavery and renounce secession. And after the ratification of, of these constitutions, the newly elected governments were to send representatives to Congress and the states thereby would be restored to the Union. Now, that doesn't sound like too bad of a plan. It's almost Lincoln's 10% plan. But according to his program, every Southern voter would have to swear an oath of loyalty in order to obtain an amnesty or pardon. Well, that's good. And several classes of Southerners were not to be given amnesty whatsoever. Former Confederate officials who supported the Confederacy. That's good. Graduates of the military academies at West Point or Annapolis who had fought on the side of the rebels. That's good. High-ranking Confederate officers and political leaders. Uh, this is good. Any individual who had aided the rebellion and owned taxable property valued at more than $20,000. Well, that doesn't sound like much, but in today's standards, that would be roughly $300,000. Uh, not so good. 
but any individual who fell into these four categories had to apply to them personally before they could get their political rights restored. Good? Uh, maybe. Now, during the summer of 1865, the white residents of every southern state worked very hard to abide by President Johnson's program so they could be ready to take the seats in the U.S. Congress when they opened up in December. So here we go. And surprisingly, Johnson handed out thousands of pardons in almost a routine fashion. And in, in some ways, he enabled the old class, or elite class, to reemerge. Re and many Confederate leaders uh, were elected at the state level. So, in a rush to re-enter the Union, some state conventions had flatly refused to even put the word secession in their constitution. They weren't going to reject it. And they certainly didn't want to reject the debt. They wanted the federal government to take that over. And all the southern states began to impose severe laws that led to the freedom of former slaves and, of course, known as black codes. And these codes included, and I have a few listed, uh, of course, there were variations of each state, but you couldn't carry a gun. You had to sign contract of employment. You had to observe curfews or be arrested. Uh, they were designed to keep the former slaves into a slave-like employment status. Every youth was required to be apprenticed to an employer um, who would exercise parental control, a white man of course. And parental consent of the child was not required. In many cases, the courts bound young men and women in their 20s as apprentices. And some states even on the disallowed former slaves from owning or even renting farms. They weren't allowed to hunt, carry farms, fish, or even have their livestock grazed freely. And most states supported institutions such as schools and orphanages did exclude the blacks totally. Okay, it's December 1865. Congress is reconvening. And as soon as they reconvened, they were all in a state of shock at what's been going on. And they established this Joint Committee of Reconstruction to examine the president's policies and voted not to admit to seat the newly elected Southern representative, which included the former Vice President of the Confederacy, four Confederate generals, five Confederate colonels, six Confederate cabinet officers, and 58 members of the Confederate Congress. Ah. And they also voted to not recognize the newly established state government as being valid. Now this was only one of the reasons, one of the big reasons that the Congress and the President are going to clash continually over the next two years. In those confrontations, the Republican membership in Congress united in support of a military reconstruction program that would guarantee political and civil rights for the Southern blacks. And Johnson aided this partly because he, they were so much against him it caused even the moderate Democrats to unite with the radicals. He had very heavy-handed efforts to block black suffrage and any congressional program that he considered, and he considered this was a usurp usurpation of presidential authority. But when Congress passed an extension of the Freedmen's Bureau Act in February 1866, most Republicans fully expected Johnson to sign it into law. Congress wanted this agency to continue a federal refugee program aimed at protecting and providing shelter and provisions for the displaced saves, slaves, as well as having trials by military commissions of individuals accused of depriving the African Americans of their civil rights. But to Congress's surprise, Johnson not only vetoed the bill, but he also attacked it as a race legislation that would encourage a life of wasteful laziness for the Southern blacks. Well, in response, Congress passed this bill five months later over Johnson's veto. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the subject of your critical analysis paper. You will be given a copy of Johnson's veto letter to Congress and a copy of the Freedmen's Bureau bill so you'll know what Johnson's talking about. President Johnson also vetoed the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1866, which defined as citizens all persons born in the United States, except Native Americans. The bill also listed certain rights of citizens, including the right to testify in court, to own property, to make contracts, and to enjoy the full and equal benefit of all laws, and of course, and the due process according to all citizens. It authorized federal officials to bring suit in federal courts rather than state courts for civil rights violations. Well, Johnson tried to strike it down as a, law, a violation of states' rights and expecting his veto to appeal to the anti-black sentiment among the northern voters. 
uh -uh. in April, Congress passed the act over Johnson's veto. And this was really the first time Congress had overridden a vote, veto vote by uh, all major legislation. When the Republicans won two-thirds control of both houses, the Joint Committee on Reconstruction passed over the President's veto the Reconstruction Act of March 1867. And this act actually divided the 11 southern states, excluding Johnson's home state of Tennessee, into five military districts subject to martial law. To be fully restored to the Union, the southern states now were required to hold new constitutional conventions elected by universal manhood suffrage. Now, these conventions would then establish state governments to ratify the 14th and the 13th and guarantee black suffrage. A military governor who was authorized by Congress controlled each district with the power to use military force to protect life and property. But once these provisional governments had to had fully complied with congressional directives, they would apply to be readmitted into the uh, Union as a state, and maybe Congress would allow them back into the Union, uh, that they reserve the right to decide each case individually. I thought that was kind of a cute picture when I found that President Johnson kicking the Freedmen's Bureau bill down the steps. Now, Johnson's not a stupid man. He, he sometimes shows poor judgment, but he's not a stupid man. And he knew that he was risking impeachment when he fired Secretary of War Stanton. Now, your text didn't mention this. Uh, there was hard feelings between Stanton and Johnson to begin with. They didn't get along personally, number one. And number two, Johnson never did like the idea that Stanton had actually purchased Alaska. It was during the same time we purchased Alaska from uh, Russia. He thought this icebox was a folly. But in a way, it was also a test. The Senate failed to convict him by one vote. They took another vote, and this vote counts as saying, uh, if I remember right, I believe it was a gentleman from Vermont who did not vote to impeach him. And basically it was the principle that Congress should not remove a president because they disagreed with policy or style. He had not committed treason. He had not done anything illegal. He just, Congress didn't like his policies. They didn't like him personally. They thought he was a drunk, among other things. So he failed to convict him. And he regained, retained his governing power as president, but he had no influence for the rest of his term on public policy or had anything. He, he couldn't do much of anything except sit in the White House. So he stayed very quiet there. So Johnson did not hate the South. He only hated the rich planter class. He was later returned to the Senate as a senator, and but he died shortly thereafter. The other man I want to introduce you to is Thaddeus Stevens. Now this man looks like he's been sucking on the lemon. I'm sorry. He's a sourpuss. He was born April the 4th, 1792, in a little place called Danville, Vermont. He was a radical Republican leader and one of the most powerful members of the U.S. House of Representatives. He focused much of his political attention on civil rights. He helped draft the 14th Amendment. He dominated the House during a Reconstruction, at the beginnings of Reconstruction, and he proposed the impeachment of President Johnson. He died in Washington, D.C. on the, August 11, 1868. So that, that's the overview, and let's look a little bit closer. He had a very difficult childhood. He, his father died when he was a baby, and he was club-footed. He was poor. He entered the political sphere in 1833, and he served four years in the local state legislature as a member of the Anti-Masonic Party. He supported banking. He supported internal improvements. These are against, see, these are against the things Johnson was for. He supported public schools, and he spoke out against slavery. He didn't like the Jacksonian Democrats and the Freemasons. He thought they were contriving plans to unfairly gain control of the government. In 1849, Stevens was elected as a Whig to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives as a congressman. And he advocated for tariff increases. He opposed the fugitive slave provision and the Compromise of 1850, and later joined the newly formed Republican Party. He became a natural leader, disregarding the fact that he always looked sourpuss. And he served as a member of the House until his death. But just a year before he was elected as a Whig, a third party called the Free Soil Party formed to highlight opposition to extending slavery to the Western territories that hadn't been organized yet. 
Now this free soil party was kind of gone by the mid 1850s and it was absorbed into the newly formed Republican Party of which Stevens became a member. And as a very important member of the new Republican, Stephen became very actively involved in the Underground Railroad and helping runaway slaves escape to Canada. The abolition of slavery slowly became his primary political focus. And as a result of this, he became one of the nation's most militant radical Republicans. He publicly condemned the Confederacy. He initiated the exclusion of traditional Southern senators and representatives after the war. And by 1866, the radical Republicans had taken significant control of Congress, due in no small part to his leadership. Stevens' reconstruction efforts were resisted by President Andrew Jackson every term, and this frustrated the congressmen uh, having to fight back against the president. And it was he who introduced, as I said, the resolution for the president's impeachment. He even chaired the committee responsible for drafting impeachment articles. He served on the committee of the Joint Committee of Reconstruction, uh, played a very important role in drafting the 14th Amendment and the Reconstruction Act of 1867. And he died a year later without ever seeing, living to see a lot of the things come to fruition. So now you have a picture of the two most important figures in Washington at the end of the war and the beginning of Reconstruction. But during the military Reconstruction, uh, with the military station in the South, many blacks began to feel empowered and hold conventions. And of course, the gist of these conventions were that they should be awarded full citizenship rights such as the right for an education, to bear arms, to serve on juries, to assemble and vote, and to be able to even serve in elected positions. Then we start getting into a fight over the women's vote in the 14th Amendment, because the wording of the amendment used the word male inhabitants. It's about this time that Susan B. Anthony and uh, Stanton withdrew their support for the 14th Amendment. Frederick Douglass, yes, he had always supported women's rights, and, but he differed with the ladies on this issue. He truly believed that women should have the right to vote, but by insisting it be in this bill, it could possibly today or even kill the bill. And he thought it was extremely important that the black man should be constitutionally able to vote. But the black women were upset too, because they felt that if you give the black man the vote and not the black woman, it would give the black man too much power over the woman. And then you get into the part of your text that talks about black men serving in Congress in hiring rebels. Is one of the first one mentioned. Free educated black who was also a minister. He recruited two regiments of African American troops and when he was in Maryland he served as a chaplain of a Negro regiment in Maryland and, and organized African American churches in that state. He established a school for the freedmen in St. Louis, Missouri in 1863 and after the war, war he served in churches in Kansas, Kentucky, and Louisiana before he settled in Natchez, Mississippi where he was selected to fill Jefferson Davis's senatorial seat, which I find quite ironic. Blanche, Kelso Bruce, he looks like a politician, I'm sorry, he just looks like he's a, well anyway, he was the first black man to serve a full term in the U.S. Senate, born into slavery but escaped as the Civil War began, and here it gets iffy. Even when you look up his biography, you don't have an awful lot about it. Where did he learn to read and write? Where did he get the knowledge to found a school? He taught school, and he founded Missouri's first school for blacks. Later, he moved to Mississippi, where he began holding a number of local county positions, and he was a sheriff. And during Reconstruction, and in 1875, he became a U.S. Senator from Mississippi, first fully elected black senator. He pressed for civil rights not only for blacks, but also for Native Americans and Chinese immigrants. And even after he left the Senate, President Garfield appointed him to several federal positions. Do you notice anything about these two men that they have in common? There, there is Rebels and here is Kelso. They even look smart, don't they? They don't look like the, what you think of as a black man out picking cotton. They look sophisticated. There are several pages of names of black men who served in Congress and proposed bill not only to help the newly freed black men but whites as well with civil rights and education and I'm not trying to slight you by not going over all the names there's just too many names for you to remember but most of the men who were elected to positions who went on with uh, working with the public they they had some experience in leadership roles or in governing and a lot of them had been ministers but it wasn't until 1871 that the blacks made their first appearance in the federal government, although some 14 of them were in the House of Representatives during the Reconstruction area. 
and South Carolina holds the uh, prize for holding the greatest number of blacks in state government. And even though they held positions of importance, a black man was never elected as governor of the state, but two did serve as lieutenant governors. Oh, don't you love this story? Robert Brown Elliott. I just about cracked up when I read it. So I went looking to get some information on him. Uh, very interesting story. Uh, it's believed that he's from the West Indies. He came to this country via England. He went to the South and married into a very powerful black family, which didn't help his, I mean, it didn't hurt his position in society at all. He became very powerful in local and national politics until, well, starting about 1867. Uh, unfortunately, when the Democrats redeemed the South, he lost his elected post and he died broke in New Orleans in 1884. Huh. You know who reminds me of? He reminds me of Duke Ellington. The pictures I've seen of him over the years. Who looks like me? In Mississippi, surprise, surprise, 40 former slaves were in their state legislature. They had a black lieutenant governor, a black secretary of state, a black school superintendent of education. In Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and North Carolina all had elected black state legislatures and all worked on government reforms and jury systems and even women's suffrage. And the wonderful part is they worked for both races, both the black and the white race. Enter the Union League. Let's talk a few minutes about that. Uh, if you've had American history, you'll know that the Union League is not even mentioned in American history. But it was a one of many organizations uh, started in the North, established in 1862, right before the war. It was supposedly to help promote loyalty to the Union and the policies of the President. Sometimes they were known as loyal leaguers. They were mostly upper middle class white men who supported the efforts and also supported the United States Sanitary Commission. I had trouble with that. And they helped treat soldiers after the battle that were wounded. The club supported the Republican Party with funding and organized support and political activism. But during Reconstruction, the Union League was formed across the South. And after 1867, it had auxiliaries down there. They mobilized the Freemen to register to vote and to vote Republican. They discussed political issues and promoted civil pro civic projects and even mobilized the workers who were opposed to certain employers. Now, most of the branches in the South were segregated, but there were a few that were racially integrated, and there were even a couple of all-black units. But even the ones who were all-black, their leaders were not former slaves. They were from the North who had never been slaves. But virtually every black voter in the South enrolled into the Union League. But with leaders and the structures from the North, they began to get a little bit militant in some states. They marched and they learned how to follow military commands. This causes a great deal of concern to some, especially when they're only supposed to be teaching the newly freed men how to become a citizen and how to vote. And of course, they would be reminded that if you're in doubt, vote for the party of Lincoln, the man who caused you to be free. And your text points out, and you can't forget the black women. Black women have always been very strong, and they're the backbone of the family. They're strong physically, they're strong mentally. And even though they couldn't vote, they considered the vote a family affair. And she'd go to conventions where she wouldn't be quiet like her white counterpart. You know, white women always sit very quietly with their little fans on their faces and their little hats. But the black woman, man, she would say what was on her mind. She'd also go to the voting polls with her husband and stand guard, sometimes holding a gun to make sure her husband got the vote and the white man didn't bother him. And heaven help the black man who voted Democratic. Oh boy. The Freedmen's Bureau. You have men and women actually getting married. The Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands Act is what's called, but we commonly know it as the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, they had a stated purpose. But part of the problem we had, now we had a perfect opportunity after the war to do something really wonderful, but we dropped the ball completely. And part of the problem was the old feeling of white superiority. Slavery was bad, but the black man was not equal to the white. And all the demands and pleas of blacks and whites were not going to change generations of mindset overnight. And your text even points out the fact that the South had abandoned lands and lack of food and clothing Successive crop failures, few farmers, no plan on what to do, little or no civil authority in the former Confederate states, 
and millions and millions of newly freed men and women not fully comprehending even the meaning of the word freedom. So enter the Freedmen's Bureau. It's an organization that was supposed to aid the newly freed people with clothing and shelter, whatever they needed to get started in a new life. It was also designed to help the poor whites. But one of the main concerns was the supervision of contracts for work between the former slave owner and the newly freed man. In four short years, they issued 21 million rations, 5 million going to whites. They supervised 46 hospitals, spent more than 2 million to improve the health of former slaves, as well as treating those who were already sick. But no law is good unless it's enforced, and no organization can do well with inexperienced and poorly trained leaders, and so it was with the Bureau. Some of the administrators actually sided with the former slave owners. But the most important work was in the field of education. Philanthropists came down from the north and the south and started school, and church, or church organizations also started schools. The biggest, Bureau's biggest and lasting contribution, and I can't say this strong enough, the biggest and lasting contribution came in the field of education. And the newly freed men and women flocked to schools. I mean, whether it was an old granny who wanted to learn how to read the Bible, or the young woman and man who knew that they had to have, know how to read and write to get along in the world. By 1870, the Bureau's work in education came to an end, and the task would then be the state's responsibility. And I... I don't like the way our author states the obvious. Most of the problems were caused by a lack of knowledge on the white men and women trying to help. Because we didn't know what the white man, the black man needed or wanted. And it's so often the case when you try to do something good, you don't succeed because you don't take the time to actually ask someone, what do you need or what do you want? But more than a quarter of a million dollars had been spent in educating the ex-slave by the Bureau and more than 4,000 plus schools were built. Of course there were schools by churches and like I said uh, they would teach the dogma of whatever their religion was. And the number of new black churches also grew, back Baptist becoming the largest denomination. And your text again points out and it's something to remember that uh, some of the better black leaders after the war were themselves ministers before getting into politics. But the newly freed men wanted three things. He wanted to be able to vote, he wanted to own some land, he wanted an education. If you owned land, you were somebody. If you owned land, you could vote, you could support your family. But owning land was the biggest problem in the South because, well, property gave you authority in voting, and no white man wanted a black man to own land. And very, very few even would consider selling even an acre to a black man. But getting them to work on your land was a different story. And when the rumor of 40 acres and a mule began to circulate, the black man was ecstatic. And in some ways, it might have been better to give the abandoned lands to them, but the government had forcibly taken the land. If they forcibly took the land from the deed-owning white man and gave it to someone else, it would set a very dangerous precedent. Because what would stop it from happening somewhere else, like in the north or the west? So the abandoned lands were returned to the former slave owners. But once free, the black men and women, they didn't have to sign contracts with a particular man if they didn't want to. They'd leave and find a better job or better deal somewhere else. And the lack of laborers began to be dangerous for the southern planner. Women and children also left the labor force. And the rumor being that the women went to uh, work in the home and the children went to work in the school. And sometimes they'd talk about these black women as playing the lady or being lazy. But were there very many black women who could afford to stay at home and play the lady? Of course not. It was a ruse, just as the old saying that the slave master always had about the black men who only wanted a white woman and were lazy. And the truth is 100% the other way. The black man was far from lazy. Some were just smarter than the others. And the last thing he wanted to do was be around more whites. Black women at home and children in school, it happened, but rarely. Like I said, usually the entire family had to work to survive. So what's the solution to the labor shortage? Ah, sharecropping. Most of the newly freed black men did not want to work for wages from a white planter because they usually really weren't paid while they were owed or they didn't get anything. So enter sharecropping, which on paper looks like a lifesaver. But leave it to the white planter to make a mess of a good plan. Here goes. I have land and you've got a strong back. Let's get together and share. I'll provide the land and the seed and even give you a place to live. 
you provide the labor and at harvest we'll split the profits. Oh, it's a great plan. It's on a paper. It's a workable plan. Oh, what are you going to do until the harvest? How are you going to eat? Oh, no problem. I'll open up a line of credit for you at the local store. And you can buy some material for your wife to make her a dress. You can get new shoes for your kids. You can buy food. And what? You can even buy some candy, peppermint candy for your children. That's wonderful. But for the most part, when crops came in, your share of the profits could not even pay the full bill at the store. Oh, well. Work another year and try to do better next time. So what happened? Because the newly freed man had never been taught the value of money or how things were priced or, or anything like this. He'd always had it taken care of for him. His, his owner fed him and clothed him and told him when to go to work. He didn't know anything about money. And charging was a fun thing to do. You could just go in that store and say, I want this or I want that, and you had it. But usually the landowner either owned a store or had a friend who did, and prices would go up on purpose. Legal slavery. You're tied to the land by contract, legally, and you can't get out because you've got no money. No, not everyone was out to re-enslave the blacks or, or take them. There were some very responsible people, both black and white, who tried to teach the black man how to become a better citizen and work and even save some money. There were even banks started by black men to help. But banks at that time only operated on the money they had on deposit, and the black depositor didn't have a lot of money to put in the banks. The federal government chartered the Freedmen's Savings and Trust Company, and it opened and rather quickly opened branches all over the South. But inaccurate bookkeeping and having help that helped themselves caused the banks to fail. Bad, bad. Frederick Douglass was made president of the bank to try to regain some stable footing, but it was a too little too late. And the bank failed and closed after a short eight-year run. 1872. All restrictions and loyalty oaths have been done away with. There's only about 600 ex-Confederates who still do not have their citizenship. And the Democrats are ruling the South. By 1876, the Republicans would only claim control of Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Elsewhere, the Democrats were in control. And they were using intimidation to discourage blacks from voting. They would destroy your home. They would ostracize you. Your job would disappear. You could have a visit in the night. You'd be beaten. You could be lynched. And, of course, enforcer groups emerged at the end of the world, the KKK and the white community, you know, the white brotherhood. I think your text lists about ten of them uh, that I, that are even got names. Some of them just put on hoods and went out to intimidate. <coughs> they wanted to put the black man back where he belonged, in bondage. Now, the camellias and the, uh, the white camellias and the KKK were the most powerful. And next lesson, I'll tell you the story of behind the beginnings of the KKK. I think you're going to be surprised. But keeping the black man from voting was a very big priority. And if intimidation didn't work, of course, you'd whip him or hang him. Yes, some of the states did attempt to stem the violence, and laws were passed. But no laws any good if it's not enforced. So Congress decided to have an investigation. Whoopee! And investigate they did. And they, then they passed laws to prevent another person from preventing anyone by vote to vote for by any reason. And they passed another law in 71 to end the KKK, and the next year they passed a law to reinforce that law. There were a lot of arrests made, very few convictions. The reign of terror does not end. And even the Republican Party had to be dissolved in several areas because of the threats of violence and actual killings. But some blacks voted anyway, they were defiant. But they become increasingly rare, and if they did vote, you'd better let it be known you voted Democratic. More and more intimidation is used to prevent the black man from voting. And if you value your home and family and life, you didn't vote. Then, too, we started hearing news of all the corruption in the Grant presidency, and there was rampant corruption. Not from President Grant himself, but uh, President Grant was a good old boy in the military, but he did not know how to choose proper leaders. He could delegate authority in the military, but he didn't seem to know. He wanted to repay people for the favors they'd done it, and he would give people jobs that were not qualified. So 1876, we're having another presidential election. Grant's already run two terms. He's old, he's tired, he wants out, and besides, President Washington had set the president just two terms. 
the old radical Republicans, the anti segregationists, they died out, and the Congress was now in the hands of younger men who were quite frankly tired of trying to get the South to change and not seeing any results. They wanted to get on with the business of making business and making money and moving west. And quite frankly, the federal court started in against blacks that they brought suit for not being allowed to vote. There is a presidential election. No clear winner. The electoral votes in Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana are in doubt. The man who wanted to be president more than anybody else, the former governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes, made a deal with the states. Give me your electoral votes and I will remove the military. They did and he did. Wow. Can't say it any plainer than that. He became president and once the troops were removed, any advances that the freedmen had obtained in civil rights rapidly evaporated. And with the removal of civil rights, a very definite color line has been drawn through the north, from the south into the north. And our next chapter is called the color line. And we're talking about legalizing segregation and the pattern of violence. And that's just a few of the topics to be discussed. Not good, folks.